известно, что широкое внедрение технологий well Controller that has a capacity uh, to uh, provide real time analytics and control connected sensors with operating actuators that protects the data. Moreover, uh, TinyML provides AI makes AI um, universal and available to all the customers, making millions of devices that we use every day intellectual and let's effectively uh, perform data mining. In the business section, we're going to talk about the non-commercial global organization and ecosystem on the development of AI uh, on TinyML microcontrollers, that's called TinyML Foundation. The association was created in 2019 in the Silicon Valley. Today it has 28 branches and 22 countries, including the United States, England, Japan, China. This uh, foundation uh, performs activities in the sphere of technology, AI on microcontrollers and on special chips accelerators ML of super low capacity. Our speakers today will include Alexander Grande from Edge Impulse, Blair Newman from Newton, Yuri Anchu, the uh, senior engineer on designing integral systems, integral schemes uh, from Juniper Networks, and the moderator today will be Evgeny Gusev, the uh, senior Director of Qualcomm. Uh, the Bay Area. It's a uh, deep night here, around midnight now. But I think the, the team is full of energy. And we are really happy to be here today and uh, to share with you this exciting world of uh, TinyML. TinyML, it's, uh, as you said, it's how you design and how you develop machine learning technology at extremely small devices. I, I have an example here. So this is um, kind of one of the devices uh, we, we, we develop and build in Qualcomm. Just to give you an idea how small this is. Again, uh, my name is uh, Evgeny Gusev. I am from Qualcomm AI Research, and uh, I am also the chairman of the board of the Tiny Mail Foundation. This is a nonprofit organization that develops and helps to accelerate Tiny Mail development worldwide. And by the way, since we submitted uh, our abstract to the Qualcomm Village, uh, uh, we've grown to 33 organizations in 26 countries now. So it's really growing really, really fast. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so we're going to have a very brief uh, introduction to TinyML because TinyML is, uh, is a new area. It's a very fast growing area. It's maybe only two, three years, two to three years old, but it grows uh, exponentially as, as you're going to see. So we'll introduce what it is. And then we will talk about market opportunities and use cases and applications. And you're going to see it's, it's uh, mind blowing. It's, it's, uh, it, it's really painful. Uh, we'll talk about uh, global ecosystem and the tiny mail foundation. And this will be just a couple of introductory bullets. But the most exciting part of today, of this morning or, or tonight in, in the Bay Area, is going to be a panel discussion. So I will be joined by top experts in this field. Um, uh, Wei Xiao from NVIDIA, Blair Newman from Newton AI. Uh, they're both also based in California. So I, I'm really thankful for their uh, support and for staying up late and after midnight uh, to join the session. And also Alessandro Grande, who represents Edge Impulse, and Alessandro is going to join us from um, from Cambridge. And uh, then uh, Yuri is going to cover 
uh, some ideas and approaches how to create a startup, in, especially in the AI, in the hardware AI. And before we start, I would also like to acknowledge the organizers who put together this program and help us. So it's uh, Elena Popova, Elena Bauer, Dmitry Yurin, and uh, Nikolai Sweden from, from Skoltech. They are really supporters of TinyML in, in Moscow, in Russia, and um, uh, we, we are very grateful for their support with, with this session. Okay, so let's start. What uh, Tiny ML is so kind of at the very high level, at the very basic level. Uh, as you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence connects physical world and, and digital world. And typically, these two worlds are connected through some kind of device that that uh, collects uh, data from the environment. It can be video data, can be audio data, can be temperature, can be environmental sensing. Can be, can be any kind of data. So this uh, device trans, uh, tra uh, transforms it into, into digital data and then the dig digital data, these zeros and ones, go to the cloud and then, um, and then you have all this analytics there. So, so that's how AI works today and we know that this approach works okay, but it has several fundamental uh, deficiencies. One, it's energy inefficient Two, it has privacy issues, which is very important these days. Three, it has latency issues. And number four, it has reliability issues. And that's where the beauty of TinyML comes to play. Uh, TinyML, it's a set of technologies that uh, um, help to do data analytics right at the boundary between the physical world and uh, in the digital world. And uh, because all the data collection and analytics happens there. This is the most energy efficient way to do artificial intelligence. Uh, the data is metadata and they're private by design. So we, we have the best, uh, the fastest latency and there are no connectivity issues. So again, fundamentally, kind of the take home message here, that fundamentally, tiny email is the ultimate way, the most energy efficient way to get machine learning done and to collect data from the physical world and transmit it into the uh, digital world. That's why these technologies are very promising. They have a lot of potential and they're really growing very, very fast, especially in the past uh, one, two years, as you're going to see from the panel discussion and from the presentation. Um, how do we define TinyML? I think very broadly we define it. It's as machine learning techniques, architectures, tools, approaches, that can do, can do on-device analytics for a variety of sensing modalities, as I said, vision, audio, motion, chemical sensing, all kind of different sensors. But the key here is it all happens at extremely low power, at typically milliwatt or below type of power. And that makes these technologies very promising for better operated devices. That's why these, these technologies have a lot of potential in, in the future. Uh, as a field, tiny ML field is quite young. So you see here, uh, I, th I think uh, we passed the kind of the initial phase of building awareness and tech visibility. And now we are getting into a very interesting phase where I see some initial tiny ML products on the market. And I think we are going to discuss them in the presentation and also during the panel discussion. And this makes it really, really, really interesting. And we predict that in about three to five years, we are going to see several tiny ML, what we call killer applications. Those are the applications of really high volume and big impact. And within uh, this decade, uh, we are going to see an explosive growth of uh, tiny ML in trillions of devices that are going to change, change the world. In, in a positive way. And talking about markets and applications, uh, let's um, kind of look at this uh, again for, for fundamentally from the top. Why tiny ML opportunity is so significant, is so enormous? And the answer is very simple. Uh, it's all about data. Uh, we know that AI and machine learning produces uh, basically uh, data and data is new oil or new electricity. So, and machine learning is just a way to, to produce this data. 
So if you talk about uh, cloud-based ML, like what people do today when they do uh, voice recognition on the cloud or picture recognition on the cloud, um, so it's only 1% of the available data there on the cloud. At the edge, like smartphone and other edge type of devices, you get like 4% of the data. But the vast majority of the data, 95% of the data is actually in the physical world. So, and this data is collected from all kinds of sensors, cameras, infrared cameras, CMOS cameras, uh, inertia sensors, microphones, uh, environmental sensors, temperature sensors, and all this type of sensors are getting into the tiny ML space where there are techniques like uh, neural network micro, and there are microcontrollers with hardware accelerators. And these uh, devices, this technology allowed to extract and digest this information. Again, fundamentally, kind of the take uh, home message here is, if you think about data as a new way of doing business, as a new oil, as a new electricity, the majority of the data is in the physical world, and TinyML actually is the engine that allows to extract this data and digest this data. It's a very, very powerful value proposition for TinyML, and that's why we believe we are going to see a lot of applications of TinyML um, in, in the future that are going really to change the world in, in a big positive way. And uh, Tiny ML opportunities are everywhere. So if you look at every vertical, every area around us, so where machine intelligence meet, meet the physical world, uh, Tiny ML is there. It's in, it's, in the, it's in the healthcare, it's in the in industrial IoT, it's in the smart cities, it's in the uh, uh, XR, uh, VR type of devices, it's in the appliances, it's in the drones, it's, it's everywhere. It's the security cameras, robots. So it's, again, enormous opportunity. Each and every of these devices is going to have some kind of tiny ML capabilities in the future or already has it today. So it's, again, a massive opportunity for tiny ML. And that's why uh, starting from uh, last year, uh, marketing companies started to realize tiny ML as a separate market category. So here you see just like one example. This came from ABI research. Uh, they show a uh, spectrum of AI technologies all the way from the cloud going to tiny ML and tiny ML you see it's ultra low power devices and sensors it's a separate market category they call it the next big opportunity in tech this is the latest white paper that came out from ABI research you see the gross numbers they are in the 50s percent extremely high uh, gross numbers again we see this field is really kind of growing and, 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 and exploding as we speak so uh, uh, this is really a big, big opportunity. And this is only devices. If you want to understand the, the total value of these solutions, including software and services, you need to multiply these numbers by a factor of 10 at least. So that's, that's really a big opportunity there. So you see some of those growth curves here. Um, actually here by application, you see a lot of uh, things happening there in the consumer space, agriculture, healthcare, industrial, retail, smart cities, all of these uh, areas are going to be seeing this significant growth in, 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 in tiny ML. Um, yeah, there are other market reports basically showing the same type of message, very significant growth numbers in all these applications. And I, I think we are going to see even more market reports in, in, in this area. Uh, let me share some examples. Uh, yeah, we still have some time to, to give a little bit more background information before we start the panel. Uh, one example is audio. Uh, audio is a very important feature like uh, keyword detection or voice direction, th this type of activities. So there are some companies doing really very interesting and very promising and very practical uh, research and development in this area and some products like on the left here you see one company Sintiant, uh, based in California so they developed this very small piece of silicon uh, so it's like one by one millimeter square a little bit more than this you, you see it's here and this small device that's why it's called tiny it can do um, voice recognition uh, and uh, uh, keyword detection up to like 64 classes at extremely low power. So basically this, this uh, small device can operate on a very small battery like coin cell battery for, for, for many years um, without any problem. So that, that's why again it's tiny but it, it's, it's very powerful. 
another example from another company in, in also in the Cal uh, Southern California, uh, and they, they show like significant uh, projections in their volumes, talking about like eight billion unit devices for for these type of technologies. So next next example is from Bosch. Bosch is uh, a well known um, sensor company, and uh, this came from the CEO. And basically, what they say that a future AI is going to be inside of each sensor. They're talking about three waves of uh, software evolution for for sensor type of devices, and what they're going to be seeing from now on, all the sensors are going to be intelligent. And they show some examples here, like how it can change uh, the world. Some example, like in baby diapers, you can put uh, technologies there, and you understand what the state of the di diaper is. Or more important um, uh, technology is uh, for forests and for wild uh, fire protection. So uh, you can de deploy this technology in forests and uh, you can get uh, some uh, signals on the early fire detection and risk management and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, another example, I'm just going to fly through this example really quickly. That's from a company, SensorMail, um, based in Portland, also in, in the US. So they, what they do, they attach these tiny email devices to uh, motors in industrial environment, in, in, in plants. And by doing so, they can uh, get some very intelligent way of doing predictive maintenance. So, so basically, you can replace some parts in a, in a, in a plant uh, before before this motor fails and that saves money in, in some cases it may save people lives so it's it's really a big impact both financially and and operationally just by deploying this type of devices this example came from sweden uh from one of the companies who are a member of tiny email so they use uh tiny email to do gesture detection like when you do hand waving or something like this uh for your uh headphones and uh, this like small device, tiny ML device, uh, it can do again gesture. Uh, another big example is um, uh, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality because these devices are very require very high energy efficiency, and tiny ML is going to play a big well. Another example is vision, like uh, you can put this, this type of uh, small devices again in every place you would like to uh, get some data analytics, um, especially in cameras and you can do things like body detection, face detection and so on. But, but what is important here is that uh, tiny mail doesn't take pictures and doesn't send them to the cloud, so there is no privacy in this small device it does all the analytics and all you get is like how many people are in the room you don't transmit faces because again all the analytics all the computation happens happens inside without without cloud, cloud being involved and that's again the key differentiation of tiny ml is uh, that uh, there is no cloud involved there is no data transmission involved all analytics happens um, at, at the tiny ml level and you see many examples here. It's uh, smartphones, watches, tablets, VR, uh, houses, everywhere. So again, a lo lo lot of opportunities there. Uh, some examples coming from other parts of the world, like, like in this case, this is an example of tiny email that came from Kenya, uh, from Africa. So they, they deploy these devices in uh, beehives and they can monitor the, the state of the, of the bee family and if, if, if they need any help. And it has a major impact. So they claim it can uh, bring like 20% of economic benefits uh, if you do it in this smart, tiny ML way. Uh, another example from uh, healthcare. Um, this is uh, by using pictures and uh, training and machine learning. And this actually happened to be an edge impulse tool. And I'm sure Alessandra is going to mention this, um, how this works. You can develop a very small tiny ML model and you can get very high accuracy for cancer detection. In this case, if you take a picture of your tongue and, and then you do all this analytics there, then, then you can get early detection of uh, cancer, for example, in, in this case. Again, a lot of opportunity in the healthcare using these uh, small devices. 
And just to summarize the use cases, this is from one of the companies, uh, Cartesian.ai. By the way, this company last week was acquired by uh, ST Microelectronics, the big giant in, in Italy and France. So they, they created all these uh, um, examples, and you can go to their website and see all of these examples there from, from their customers. So it's, it's, it's everywhere, in the, in the oil drilling, in, in the electrical cars, in, in, in the motors, uh, even in, in like in the wine testing. So a lot of examples there in the cardio area. So, so, so again, the take message, take away message here is if you look around yourself and see any kind of areas where you can use this uh, low power devices and uh, smart intelligence, that, that's where TinyML is going to play a big role and, and make a difference there. And before we start, before we move on to the, to the panel discussion, let me just talk a little bit about it the whole tiny email ecosystem and the foundation and what we do to connect this global network of uh, companies, experts, enthusiasts all over the world um, who work on tiny email. So tiny email foundation is a nonprofit organization uh, in, um, in California, in the Los Altos, but this is a global organization and, and the mission is really to accelerate the growth of a prosperous and integrated global community of hardware, software, system engineers and scientists who work in, who work in this area. And, and really the goal here is to connect technologies to, to the business world and to create a lot of opportunities on the, in the business and value creation called the whole ecosystem as we discussed before. And uh, the vision here is that we see a new world with trillion of intelligent devices enabled by TinyML that sense, analyze, and act together to create a healthier and more sustainable environment uh, for all of us. So the mission of the organization is to grow the ecosystem, is to exchange information, knowledge, to inspire, and to connect uh, technologies to business and, and create uh, value this way. So this, uh, the ecosystem, the whole ecosystem has been growing extremely fast. You see the data from the past uh, three years. Every year we organize our global summit, uh, starting from, from the Google event, the event we had at Google in March 2018. So you see the number of people and the companies and everything has been growing to like thousands now. So it's a really big global community, including, including also Asia. Uh, and there are multiple drivers for this, for this growth. Uh, the hardware is becoming more uh, energy efficient, and I think Yuri is going to talk about this. We see more energy efficient algorithms, neural networks. That's what uh, uh, Blair is going to talk about in the panel discussion, because his company is developing these extremely energy efficient algorithms. The software infrastructure tools are becoming more uh, mature and more readily available and easier to use. Like again, tools like um, Edge Impulse tools and AutoML type of tools make a tiny email application development is quite easier compared to several years ago. So you, you don't need to be a machine learning scientist um, to, to develop your own application. And that's actually the beauty of tiny email for people with business like mindset you don't really need to know what is under the hood. I mean, you, you need to know what problem to solve and you need to have data for this problem. And then tiny email and the whole ecosystem is going to help. And we'll talk about this at the panel discussion as well. We see very diverse in this ecosystem. We see a growing number of applications. I show some of them like two minutes ago, but this only like probably 1% of what is available, what is not. Uh, we see a lot of investment in the corporate world. Uh, I think only in the past, uh, like two weeks, we saw several startup companies, including Edge Impulse, who closed um, uh, Series A funding uh, in, in uh, many tens of millions of dollars. Uh, some acquisitions, like I mentioned, that uh, Cartesian was acquired by ST Micro. A lot, a lot of kind of activities happens in, in the VC and business world there and we see more startup and M&A activities in this space. So that makes this field really booming and very healthy ecosystem to be and very healthy ecosystem to invest with, with a lot of potential returns. And uh, again, we'll talk more about this in five minutes during our panel discussion. Talking about numbers, so you see here, this is uh, uh, the uh, tiny email, um, global community just from meetups 
So we, we have now we have 33 um, uh, groups in 26 countries and it's like over 5,000 people, very fast growth you see here on the left and it's gonna keep going up and up. So we have uh, several events. Um, uh, summit is our annual top level event. Uh, as I said, this year it was uh, attended by 5,000 people registered for this event. Uh, Last year we had one in the Asia in Shanghai, it was about 2,000 people. And uh, as an announcement, we are going to have um, a tiny male European, Middle East and Africa event in two weeks and this will be also live. Uh, additionally, there are almost weekly, there are webinars, meetups, talks, uh, there is a YouTube channel that is uh, open and free, it has a few thousand subscribers. A lot of activities, uh, all of them around awareness, uh, products, partnerships, and so on. And if you're interested, you can go to the tinyml.org, very simple website to remember, and you will see all these activities and how, how to get involved. Um, this is the European event, as I mentioned. So it will happen in, in two weeks. Uh, it is going to be European, Middle East, and Africa. Very interesting program. I would encourage you to go to the website and check the program and, and attend, attend this event. Asian event, as I said, was also very popular and we're going to have another one this fall. Uh, additionally, in addition to the events, a uh, big focus is on educational activities. We have EDU at TinyML Foundation and uh, they do a lot of educational activities uh, also around the world, all the way to high school students and, and their teachers. Uh, some of the examples here, this is a, a Coursera class uh, produced by Edge Pals and the edX by Harvard Research Symposium. So here you see um, we started an initiative Tiny Email for Good and we are very passionate about this initiative because unlike the cloud-based uh, ML technologies, Tiny ML has a potential to democratize ML and give the technology back to people. And uh, you're going to see more activities in this space in the Tiny ML Foundation. And it's going to be revolving around three pillars, healthcare, STEM, and climate and conservation. So again, super excited about this initiative and, and you're going to hear more about this. Uh, because if you look at the UN uh, Sustainability Development Goals, I think TinyML has uh, in half of them, of, 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 the, of the 17. Another example, we just started TinyML Vision to develop new use cases and applications. And if you're interested in joining TinyML ecosystem, just go to tinyml.org and, uh, and you'll see a lot of information there. So I think we are perfect on time. It's 27 minutes after midnight in California. Uh, and I think at this point, we are ready to move uh, to the panel discussion. And the, the theme of the panel discussion is going to be, uh, let's make the tiny ML big. So it is really my pleasure and the privilege to have three, these three distinguished uh, experts of tiny ML who will be joining uh, me tonight in California again morning Moscow time. It's Wei Xiao from NVIDIA. She's in charge of AI in emerging areas. Blair Newman, he is the CTO of Newton AI and Alessandro Grande, uh, Director of Technology at Edge Impulse. So I think at that, at that point, I would like to introduce our panel and uh, and I think uh, we are ready to start. And please, if you have any questions, uh, e either about the introductory part of the presentation or as we do the panel, sell, send them online and we'll answer them as they arrive because we would like this to be a very inter interactive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, let's start the panel discussion. So uh, I think my first question to the panelist will be, um, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself. Like what is your background? What is your company doing? What are the products? Uh, what makes you passionate about TinyML? And uh, 
how did you start your journey with TinyML? So, so that the audience can kind of understand and learn a little bit more about, uh, about this very diverse group of people. So let's start maybe with Wei. I think Wei, you're on mute. <laughs> Wei, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So yeah, thank you, Evagini. So first, I want to thank you for inviting me to this panel discussion. Uh, I'm Wei from NVIDIA, working on extend NVIDIA's foothold in emerging markets and the emerging technologies. I think some of the audience probably still think NVIDIA as a gaming company, but frankly, NVIDIA's operational model shifted to AI in recent years. Uh, our hardware and the software AI acceleration platforms have uh, penetrate have been penetrating into uh, robotics, autonomous driving, fintech, and all the major industry verticals. Uh, prior to NVIDIA, I was at ARM uh, leading the AI ecosystem activities. Uh, I had the opportunity to be part of the TinyML global meetup team and the technical program committee of the TinyML Asia event, really witnessed the community grew from one single location to over 30 locations in one and a half year. The momentum there is truly amazing. So again, uh, I would say it's a real pleasure to be here to join this panel discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining. So let's continue with the West and then we'll move to the East. So Blair, you're on the same time zone. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, thank you, Evgeny. Um, I'd like to, I guess, thank all of you guys for allowing for us to, to be here. Uh, my name is Blair Newman, I'm the CTO here at Newton. Um, just to maybe introduce Newton as an organization, we've been around for a little over 17 years. Uh, at least for myself, I've been with the organization for the last six years. And prior to that, I was with Deutsche, Deutsche Telekom for a little over 11 years. Uh, from an organizational perspective, uh, we've been involved with, in machine learning for some time. But more recently, over the last five to six years, we've really embarked on a, a journey uh, where I would say our mission truly is to make machine learning or tiny ML available to everyone, which I think really aligns with not only the mission with tiny ML, but also the enablement of a number of different organizations that I think are probably here in this audience today from a startup perspective. Um, our objective uh, really um, especially when you talk about where tiny ML is at today is really from an enablement perspective. So how can we enable organizations that may be new to machine learning? How can we enable them to be successful? How can we enable them to maybe accelerate their time in the market? Whether they have, you know, whether they have a, a, a fairly small IT organization and they're new to machine learning or whether they have a fairly robust IT organization and are looking to accelerate moving forward. So I'm really excited to be a part of this panel so that we can share, you know, how we're bringing value, uh, uh, not only to this, you know, to this panel, to this organization, but how we feel that we can continue to be a part of Tiny ML moving forward as it relates to its overall global success. So thank you again for allowing for us to be here and um, uh, I look forward to the discussion as we move forward. Yep. Great. So, and now we are moving from night to, to morning in, 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 in the UK. So, Alessandro, your turn. Hi, Evgeny. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you. I wanted to just first echo everyone else uh, and thank you, uh, Evgeny, and everyone else here organizing this, uh, this panel. Uh, it's great to be here. And I'm excited to talk about TinyML always and, and uh, you know, really excited today. Um, so, a bit of background about. Uh, of myself, I, I started getting involved in TinyML in 2018, actually, at ARM. Um, I, I got, um, I came across this little, uh, this little board here, uh, one of the first, uh, uh, I guess, TinyML -abled, enabled boards. Uh, it's a camera with a little microprocessor on it, and uh, uh, it's really impressive. You know, from the first day I started using it, I was impressed by the, the, the potential uh, and the power there. Um, so after, after getting involved uh, in TinyML for a few years, um, with actually Wei at ARM as well, uh, we, we then, um, uh, I then got involved in the actual TinyML organization. I founded uh, with, uh, with other 
committee members, the TinyML UK uh, branch, uh, and now the Italian branch as well. Um, and that's all because it's really exciting to um, you know tell people about this uh, this technology and uh, and enable others to innovate on top of it, right? Um, and uh, now I'm at Edge Impulse, uh, and for the ones of you that don't know, this is a um, is a platform that in enables developers and enterprises to really unlock business value by uh, producing TinyML applications effectively. Um, and um, that's, that's, a bit, that's a bit about me. I guess we'll, we'll dive a bit more in, uh, in the details. So Evgeny, I'll, I'll bring it back to you. Yeah, no, great. Th thank you for the introduction, Alexandra and, and Wei and uh, Blair. I just want to highlight that we have a very diverse group of uh, panelists here because we have people represented hardware companies like NVIDIA and myself from Qualcomm. We have Blair and Alexandra covering both software, uh, AutoML and, uh, and infrastructure there. So really, it's, it's a very intelligent group of people uh, and people who have a lot of experience in, in this field. So we are really fortunate to have them tonight or this morning on this stage. So my, my first technical question is, um, is Юрий, он будет у нас доклад делать потом. Uh, yeah, Yuri, why don't you introduce yourself uh, to, I mean, you're going to have a presentation later, but uh, just for completeness, yeah. Yuri, you're on mute. Okay, so uh, my name is Yuri Panchal. I am a chip designer, so, so I, uh, right now I, just finished to design a block in a large chip for uh, for internet routers uh, in the past i was working in a mips uh, company which uh, which uh, which designs process of course and uh, uh, back in mips i was actually introduced uh, to the field of internet of things where you have like a very small chip and uh, like uh, microcontroller chips and chips uh, like put into sensors it's like network of sensors and uh, from my perspective uh, a tiny ml and uh, hardware accelerators is sort of extension of this of this uh, uh, internet of things uh, paradigm uh, like it's just a way to make like network of uh, s uh, s small device uh, smarter to like recognize uh, their uh, environment. Uh, also, uh, in the past, I was a founder of a small uh, startup company which got VC funding, uh, including uh, uh, including funding from, from, from Intel Capital. And uh, from this experience, I know precisely what it takes to make a startup. So uh, I will uh, present after 30 minutes some like general uh, concepts uh, how hardware engineers work, uh, why this is relevant for like tiny ML and how uh, startup that uh, that uh, uses uh, both hardware design and links to software ecosystem can make a difference in this uh, uh, new uh, emerging market. Yeah, th thank you, Yuri. So as you can see, Yuri has a unique experience both in the hardware, hands-on experience in, in, in designing chips and also in the startup area. So his experience is going to be quite valuable. And he's going to share it after the panel in, in, in the presentation, how to start uh, AI hardware acceleration startup. So, so again, we have a very diverse panel and um, let's, let's go. So first question, I think machine learning technologies are not new. And I think before machine learning technologies were, became machine learning technologies, there was big data, there was internet of things, all kinds of uh, different names. So my question to the panel is, in your opinion, what makes tiny ML so unique and differentiated compared to like what, what happened before? Who is going to start? So <clears throat> maybe, maybe I'll start. Um, so I'll kind of reflect just briefly kind of on, on your presentation where you mentioned that really tiny ML is in a literal sense, it is truly the combination of the physical world and the digital world. And it's really, uh, our attempt to really integrate the two. One of the things that you've mentioned is that 
when it comes to TinyML, 95% uh, of the data is in the physical world. And now the question is, how do we get that data in an intelligent way inside some of the smaller devices that you've illustrated, uh, Alessandro has, has illustrated as well? How do we do that in a very efficient way? And I think that's really one of the not only unique attributes, but also challenges as it relates to TinyML. And that's one of the things that at least for ourselves that we're really truly focused on is really enabling uh, organizations to be able to successfully not only build a model, but build it efficiently so that it can integrate into some of these smaller devices so that they can being able to implement some of the use cases and applications that are out there. And that's one of the things that I would like to say, you know, is, is inherently the challenges that exist today is, you know, in one aspect, you have your data. And then in the second aspect, you have the challenge of how can I take my data? How can I build a model that can be efficient enough so that it can actually execute efficiently on the hardware that is out there today? And I think that's one of the very unique challenges that are out there. And that's one of the things, or I, I would say, one of the challenges that we're helping some of our customers solve as well. So that's kind of how I view it at the moment. Yeah. I want to add something here. Yeah, I think this goes along with what Blair just mentioned. Uh, I think the first major differentiator is the share size of the market. I think Avagini uh, said 60 billion market share by uh, market size by 2024. And yeah. uh, also I did some research online. I think uh, globally, the microcontroller shipment is roughly 50 million per year. So if we can add cognitive capabilities to these microcontrollers, we we'll really enable a lot of mini minds and nanomans out there. Um, the second aspect, I would say, is uh, energy efficiency. Uh, I think, again, Evergini mentioned this in his presentation. Uh, MCU-based solutions use significantly less power compared to microprocessor or GPUs, so which makes them can be placed anywhere. Uh, the other aspect is low cost. Um, many of the microcontrollers used in the tiny mouse space today are based on ARM Cortex-M architecture. Um, these microcontrollers are of low cost, they're reprogrammable, so which make tiny mouse applications really accessible to the end user. Yeah. If, Kenny, if, I, if I may jump in as well and add, add, add a little bit as well. Um, so to, to Wave's point, you know, being at ARM, I saw the the rise of uh, of microcontrollers, right? Um, I mean, you know, it's it's impressive to see how many microcontrollers ship a year, uh, and that's just the ARM microcontrollers, right? There's a whole load of other microcontrollers out there. Um, I mean, you know, the last estimates I've read are um, that we've got around 50 billion uh, microcontrollers in the world. Uh, that's according to NCTA. Uh, so it's it you know the the volume of uh, of objects out there that can run machine learning. Um, with TinyML is is absolutely impressive, and one of the the other interesting points of uh, of the microcontrollers in general is that they are super low power, right? So uh, you mentioned that before, um, and what that means is that you can now run uh, programs on these microcontrollers that um, enable you to get get uh, information from the data coming from the microcontrollers for months, if not years, um, without actually using uh, you know any any energy other than the the little battery that might be connected uh, to the microcontroller. Another interesting thing uh, that's kind of tangential, but it's it's also interesting is that there's a lot of research on energy harvesting, and you know um, I think in the future we will see more of that, and that will enable uh, again these devices, this, these tiny devices, to make sense of data. Um, forever effectively right and that's uh, and that's i think you know a huge huge opportunity no definitely i, I think that's that's a very strong value proposition too and it kind of fundamentally the, the way i think about it is that the traditional ml models cloud-based ml they're going higher in energy high in power bigger models and tiny ml kind of going going the other way to make it more energy efficient smaller i think you mentioned energy harvesting effectively this type of devices can basically 
operate by themselves without kind of much human intervention, like replacing batteries, the, 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 this kind of things. And that's, that's really, really powerful. And if you can do it in a, in a private way and, and give it back again to, to, to people. So Blair, you mentioned several times the, the word challenges. And I, I really love this word challenges because in my mind, when I hear challenges with my right ear, the left one hears opportunities, right? So it's challenges and opportunities, they always kind of come together. So, so my, my, my question uh, to you is, yes, I think we are at the beginning of this uh, tiny ML area uh, or revolution, we could say, what is, in your opinion, is the maturity level of, of tiny ML? Or what, what are the challenges? What, what are the bottlenecks? What are the hurdles um, that we currently have that uh, um, the whole community can start to resolve? And as usual, if there is a big challenge that, that is uh, solved it, it takes an opportunity opportunity to have a company startup product this this kind of thing so so kind of two sides of the same question like where we are right now in our development cycle with the whole time email and what, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities you see in this space from the technology perspective yeah i think uh, yourself and uh way and alessandro kind of touched on it what we're kind of seeing right now is that from a hardware perspective um it is becoming more and more efficient, meaning smaller in size, smaller in consumption of power. And then you also kind of touched on that from a pure machine learning perspective, we're beginning to see maybe models grow, right? And now that's kind of caused this kind of uh, squeeze where now today, if you're looking to take your traditional models that you have, you kind of have to go through this, this process of optimizing your models, whether it's, you know, pruning your models or whatever the case may be, so that now the models are now needing to catch up with the efficiency of the hardware today, right? So that's the challenge, but that's also the opportunity. And when, especially when you, when you think about, let's say, our audience today, how can they address this opportunity or this challenge that's being presented today? And I think that's one of the areas that we're looking to address is the traditional means of doing machine learning is actually kind of to some degree going in the opposite direction that the hardware is going. So the hardware is becoming more and more efficient and we're seeing that the traditional way of doing machine learning as it relates to tiny ML is becoming less and less efficient. And this is one of the things that I like to highlight that we're addressing. So we're kind of, let's say flipping the paradigm on his head where we're developing models that are keeping track with the efficiency of hardware. So as hardware is becoming more and more efficient, more and more commoditized, because that's just the nature of our business, hardware becomes more and more commoditized, we see that software is kind of going the other way. And this is one of the areas that we've kind of recognized is from a Newton perspective, how can we stay on track to be more and more efficient from a hardware perspective, where we're building models to stay on track with hardware as it becomes more efficient instead of going in the opposite direction. So when I kind of look at the state as to where TinyML is today, when you look at it from a market perspective, I think you've kind of highlighted that to some degree we're in its infancy stage, but it's, it is, it's a very evolving space. Um, hardware is accelerating in one direction, Machine learning to some degree is not keeping pace with hardware as it's, as it's becoming more and more efficient. So how can we enable organizations to be able to produce models so that they can be on par or even more efficient than how the hardware market is going? And that's one of the things that we're doing today. We're producing models so that to a large degree, our customers don't have to have on the forefront of their mind, you know, what hardware do I have? because they're able to produce models that are small enough so that they can integrate into any hardware device that may align with their particular use case. Yeah, well, that, that's definitely a great observation. Uh, I 100% I agree with this. On the philosophical side of things, why do you think this is happening? Hardware people are going this way and the software people are going that way. Is it kind of different in, in the mindset, different in mentality? So again, it's kind of a little bit of a philosophical question. I think we've seen this before with Windows, right? I mean, you used to be able to start your Windows computer with a floppy disk, and now you, yeah. you need to have 100 gigabytes of memory just to run your operational system, right? So are we kind of going the same way as 30, 20 years ago? Or? 
Yeah, it, it, you like to say that everything is cyclical, right? And so yeah. it, what we experienced before on the, on the server side of things, we're experiencing now on the tiny ML side of things, right? It's, it's, it's just a natural course of, uh, of, of, of business, I like to say, where hardware becomes more efficient. And to some degree, oftentimes the software becomes a, a little bit more bloated than what it used to be in the past. Yeah, definitely. Software is a big part of the creation. But talking about software, Alessandro, what is your take on the on the on the maturity of where we are and the challenges ahead? Yeah, interesting question. I, I think um, you know you, you just asked another interesting question about like you know why why this uh, divergence between hardware and software, right? Um, I guess in my view is that. Um, there is a big disconnect between the people building the hardware and the people building the software, right? Um, especially when it comes to machine learning, because effectively, uh, you know, for, for many years, uh, embedded, embedded engineers have built uh, applications uh, and they're very, you know, embedded, embedded applications, right? Um, these are applications that are uh, very uh, kind of standard software applications where machine learning is slightly different in the sense that uh, you have to make sense of data uh, in a statistical way, right? And, uh, and you know, as um, uh, as Blair was saying as well, there is a lot of different hardware devices out there, and uh, making sense of what the hardware is telling you or giving you um, is is quite challenging for for developers. So um, you know, my my idea is that um, you need you need to like take a uh, it, it, it's um, it's a growing market, and there is a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, need for kind of combining or uh, building a bridge between uh, software developers, especially data scientists and embedded engineers. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, really great tools out there, uh, a lot of great platforms. I mean, we've seen uh, the rise of obviously TensorFlow Lite Micro and how that evolved over time um, to make actually developers' lives easier. Uh, at Edge Impulse, we're building uh, a tool, uh, a platform that actually enables uh, developers to uh, kind of take data, uh, stream it in the platform and make sense of it uh, and then produce a model that can run on the device uh, for the application they want. And I think, you know, I think we'll see more of um, more platform, more tools to enable developers uh, to kind of do their job, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, we're all trying to kind of unlock the business opportunity here uh, that, as we said, as we all said, is, is massive. So, so basically, you answer, Alexandra, we need to develop better platforms that are kind of closely, closely connected to the, to the hardware world. So, so basically, it's software people and hardware people work together to develop both kind of efficient hardware platforms and also the software tools and platforms that are built for this type of hardware. That's, that's probably the answer, right? Absolutely, yes. It's a core design, yeah. And talking about core design, way, what is your experience with core design? And uh... <laughs> well, <laughs> since I'm uh, coming from an ecosystem background, I would love to share my thoughts from the ecosystem perspective. The way I view an ecosystem is like it's like a grid. It consists of both vertical solutions and the horizontal solutions. So if we look at the hardware landscape of 10ML, now we have companies like ARM designs a rich portfolio of microcontrollers that are capable of running machine learning solutions. Vertically, we have uh, like a Qualcomm always on, a uh, vision module, we have syntax uh, voice module that really address the specific challenges in each industrial verticals. So same thing is happening in the software landscape. So if we put TinyML software ecosystem into this XY plane, horizontally, we have Google TensorFlow Lite Micro. We have like OctoML compiler-based solutions that provides faster inference on different types of microcontrollers. Uh, two side, Algi Impulse, Catism, uh, so they all provide a different type of solutions for you know, different industrial verticals that significantly lower the application developer's barrier to entry. So from there, uh, I think more and more developers will be able to focus on the application logic of 10ML application development and really focus on different industrial verticals. 
Great. Well, thank, thank you Wei, for sharing your perspective. And I think that's a good segue into the next topic, which is you mentioned that the, uh, the technology is there, both the hardware and there are more tools coming to the market. The tools are getting better, the hardware is getting better. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to create a pull force, like the market needs to use this technology and, and drive them. Um, can you kind of elaborate on, um, on what you think is or, and what you see is happening in the marketplace in terms of early adoption of dynamic technologies? Are there any use cases? new applications, new market verticals, a tiny mail is going to play a big role or enable new things there. Kind of, again, you've yeah. been kind of in this business for several months, several years. Um, so kind of what kind of trends do you see from, from your perspective? Yeah, I would say I can see a lot of opportunities in both consumer and industrial spaces. Uh, one use case I would love to share is a medical device. So TinyMail can really add a cognitive capabilities to traditional wearable devices, taking hearing aids as an example. So we all know that a traditional hearing aids probably use an amplifier to augment the sound it receives. But for people with hearing loss, louder volume doesn't provide a complete solution. So the newer generation of hearing aid uh, use machine learning models to dis distinguish speech from the background noise and can filter out unwanted noise in any challenging listening environment. Actually, the same technology not only powers up hearing aids, it's being applied to consumer products as well, like TWS, uh, true wireless stereo, headphones manufacturers also use machine intelligence to cut noise and boost uh, consumers' hearing experience. Well, that, that's a great example, Wei, and I think I like it for two reasons. One, it's, it's really a big market because like there are so many people that need these hearing devices. And in fact, people who use hearing devices today is still not the, the majority of people who need to use them. I mean, the market size is actually bigger than that what people use today. And second, it's really a, a good example where tiny email technology can make a big difference in terms of sound yeah. quality. Yeah. And, and exactly. It's a really big, big opportunity there. So, so Blair, from, from your angle, um, what, what is your crystal ball telling you about tiny mail <laughs> applications? <laughs> <laughs> crystal ball. Okay, so um, I, I guess I'll kind of touch on, on, on two things. Uh, first being, let's just say, what, what does the market kind of, kind of look like, right? And to kind of tie in your, your previous question about kind of, you know, the state of things and, and, and how we're moving forward, um, what, one of the things that I kind of see is, you know, how do we now bridge the software side with the hardware side. And I think when you begin to talk about market opportunities, you begin to, at least in my mind, talk about enablement. So how do we now begin to enable communities to be able to produce these use cases that can continue to grow this particular ecosystem? So when I talk about enablement, this, this may mean um, being able to enable organizations who may not have that data scientists. This may mean being able to produce models that are maybe, uh, from what we see, you know, being able to produce models that are, you know, 100, 1,000 times smaller than what we see today, uh, 100, 1,000 times uh, being able to execute inferences more efficiently than what we see today. This is what I see as the market opportunity that will enable all of these different use cases. Here we are today, or this evening, as it relates to uh, being a part of the Startup Village, where there is a number of different organizations with a number of different I ideas and business opportunities that we're looking to execute on. So this is where I kind of see where um, the market opportunity exists, enablement. How can we continue to enable uh, our colleagues that are listening to us today to be able to execute on their use cases. From a crystal ball perspective, my vision in five years from now is that everyone has their own personalized model, their own personalized ecosystem from a machine learning perspective. So as they kind of traverse throughout society that they're enabled with various different personalized experiences, whether 
you know, you're in a retail store, whether you're in, in the hospital, you know, your personalized ecosystem kind of follows you throughout the day. So that's my, that's my vision, my crystal ball for five to 10 years from now. That, that's very interesting. So effectively, you're talking about like a brain print, right? So it's basically, yeah. <laughs> You have a brain print of your brain somewhere and that kind of makes you everything personal for you. That's are, are just your personalized experiences, your data follows you, your own neural network follows you throughout your day. Okay, and Alessandra, question for you again, the same kind of crystal ball type of question. Tiny ML 2025, <laughs> we meet together in Rome and we are having a good beer there or better Italian wine and talking about the killer app in 2025. What do you think this 2025 killer app is going to be? Interesting question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball, but... but, um, <laughs> well, but big, 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 because Blair has it. <laughs> 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 I, I'll, I'll take a stab, but uh, something that, you know, it's very close to my heart. Um, and, and that is like wildlife conservation, or in general, actually, not just wildlife, but uh, conservation of our world in general. I think um, we're starting to see some interesting applications. Uh, we've, um, we've partnered closely with uh, uh, Smart Parks and um, they've developed this, this interesting collar, for, collar for, um, for elephants to track them in the wild and, and not just track where they are. Uh, obviously that, that, you know, that helps with the conservation and with poachers, um, but also to kind of, uh, by making sense of the data coming from uh, the elephant behavior, they can track uh, what the elephant is actually kind of uh, thinking or, or, well, thinking with quotes uh, or, or kind of um, about to do uh, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, interact and do something in advance uh, where there is a danger, or where there is a, um, a challenge for, for the animal. Uh, and, you know, more widely than that, I think there is a lot of, uh, um, you know, in the world, we have a lot of, uh, uh, challenges when it comes to uh, wildlife and, uh, and our in general our kind of um, natural ecosystem and and uh, I, I you know I really hope that this low power technology can actually unlock um, actual solutions uh, that can bring the world um, to a better future. Uh, so that's that's my 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 hope for the future. Um, and, you know, as I said, we're starting to see some interesting applications in that space. Uh, so, I, and I, you know, and there is also um, a, a great business value there because it's a really untapped potential. So that's why I think, I think it, can, it can really be, uh, you know, a killer app for, for the future. No, I definitely share your optimism here for, for a couple of reasons. I think one, it's, it's really a real problem to be solved, right? I mean, it's been a problem for a while and now it's there. Second, now there are technologies like tiny ML technologies, like the, the tools that what um, uh, NVIDIA, ARM and other companies, Qualcomm offer, and software tools like AutoML tools like Newton AI and uh, Edge Files and other companies. And number three, which is probably the most important part, I think in the past, Several months we've been working very closely, uh, Tiny Mill Foundation, with uh, several groups in Africa. And these people and engineers are very, very passionate about Tiny Mill. And uh, the number one reason why they like Tiny Mill is really for this type of things. They, they see problems around them and they want to use this technology to change the world for, for, for themselves, for their neighbor, for their countries. Uh, again, the technology is there, the tools are there, the people are there. So I think that's to me, all these good ingredients for, for success there. So I think definitely we're going to see some positive impact there. And uh, I think we are running out of time for the panel. Uh, my very last question to the panel is, uh, we talk about challenges and I think I want to turn this into opportunities. So I'm sure there are people in the audience um, who listen to this and think, well, I would like to start, uh, this is so cool, tiny emails, so cool, so promising. I would like to start a company in this space. So what would be your advice to someone in, the, in this area, people with kind of business, entrepreneurial type of skills, if they want to start a tiny email company? Like what, what would you advise them to do um, to, to make it a successful business? Any, any secret sauce recipes or anything you can recommend? I guess I would comment first. <laughs> yeah, like a pet, but, yeah. um, 
you know, uh, at Newton, our, our, our motto is, is really is two things. One is we want to bring uh, machine learning or tiny ML to everyone. But more importantly, um, I think it's important that you want to be able to bring your services to the fingertips of your customer. So whatever you are developing, whatever are you looking to bring to the market, uh, just focus on bringing those services to the fingertips of your customer. And our other model that we like to have, especially uh, uh, when, as it relates to TinyML, is we like to say, you know, build fast, build once, and never compromise. And that would be my, my feedback to, okay. to the audience. So build once, never compromise. And fo focus on your customer and focus on, on his experience. Yep. Yeah, that's a good advice. Yeah, I would say I think TinyML is an inexorable trend because all the benefits we talked about. So even a tiny amount of intelligence to the existing process can really bring the process to the next level. Um, like we discussed, I think a let, uh, at the application layer, uh, TinyML presents a lot of opportunities in consumer industrial spaces. Um, and also from a technical opportunity perspective, we still see a lot of technology gaps in between like um, algorithm optimization. How can we deploy the TinyML solutions to billions of devices out there or power consumption? I think those technical opportunities can be converted to business opportunities as well. Um, I think the last word I want to say is TinyML community is a really vibrant community. So tap into it, leverage it. It will help startups to grow. So, so basically your recommendation way is partner uh, wherever is possible because the community is so big, there are different people do, doing different things. Just focus on one problem you want to solve. Yeah. And really partner with, with the rest of the ecosystem that, that will help you. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I like this. Alexandra, any perspective from you? Yeah, I think, you know, in my experience, uh, one of the things that as, as companies that are helping developers in, in, the, in the ecosystem out there, one of my um, uh, challenges has always been to like understand real problems, right? Like in the sense that I'm not, I'm not the one that has the problems because I'm not building, uh, I'm not building actual products uh, out there in the market. So really everyone listening that is building a product probably has some problems that uh, TinyML can solve, right? So it's up to you to kind of come up with, uh, look at your, um, your domain of expertise and, and, and kind of bring those problems to the TinyML community. So to echo what, um, what Wei said, there are communities all over the world. So I'd invite you know, everyone to kind of uh, come with their problems to, to the TinyML meetups, to the TinyML Summit, uh, the EMEA Summit that's coming up, and, and really kind of propose uh, or talk about their problems, uh, because I, I'm, I'm sure that together, you know, we can come up with, with a solution um, for, for that problem with, uh, with TinyML. Uh, and one, one last thing, actually, if you are, um, you know, new to TinyML and, and want to get started, um, one thing I'll, I'll, uh, I'll advise is to go uh, check out the, the Coursera course, um, Introduction to TinyML. It's a free course, so you can you know just go and take it. And it's a collaboration with with uh, Edge and Pulse, Arm, TinyML, and Arduino. So um, you know, have a look at that if you want to get started in this world. And by the by the way, Alessandro, this uh, Coursera class was ranked as the top the one in in the ML in the past like months or so. It was the most popular uh, ML class um, uh, on Coursera. So if I, if I were to summarize this uh, startup uh, opportunities, so it, it, it's basically focus on the problem, that's what Alexandra said, partner with the ecosystem, that's what Wei said, and then as Blair said, build once and win. So those are the three simple recipes and then, then, then you can retire <laughs> after this. Well, th thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Wei. Thank you very much, Blair, for joining us at uh, past midnight in California. I really appreciate your, your wisdom, your, your passion in tiny mail, and Alessandro for, for you joining us in, in the morning. And uh, 
Uh, I'm sure we'll collaborate more in the future uh, as, as the kind of tiny ML community grows. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And I think at this point, we are going to turn the mic to Yuri, who has uh, some hands-on experience in, in designing ASIC chips and uh, hardware chips and also building startups around this. So he is going to share his uh, experience and his perspective on, uh, on the hardware side of things, uh, specifically how to design hardware accelerators um, for, for tiny ML. What are the challenges? What are the architectures? What are the solutions there? And, uh, and how do you possibly build a company around this? So Yuri, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. So uh, my name is Yuri Panchu. Let me put full screen. So um, my name is Yuri Panchul, and uh, uh, like I'm working in Silicon Valley for 30 years uh, since 1991. Uh, uh, like most recently, I designed chips in Juniper and in MIPS, and before this, I was a founder of a VC-funded startup. So like I have complete startup experience uh, and uh, uh, recently in the last uh, 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 10 years i was involved in many educational programs in russia and uh, uh, i know uh, like where you can find engineers who can actually can uh, design some uh, chips uh, in russia so uh, first of all uh, just like couple of words why do we actually need custom hardware for uh, for the field uh, for the field of tiny uh, of tiny ml the problem uh, there are two things here first thing is a, a, a microcontroller the performance of microcontroller is very very low comparing to performance uh, like of like a regular or like even a high-end embedded system uh, like a, a cell phone so like basically if you put a, a like if you put machine learning you know a, a microcontroller it will perform many tasks in software uh, only very slowly like uh, for instance like here like i make a video uh, oh uh, Я буду говорить на русском, потому что большинство э, людей говорят по-русски, поэтому я сейчас включу translation. Одну uh, секунду. Uh, interpretation. Russian. Uh -huh. Вот. Э, значит, вот... вот э, uh, what a mere to yes. Here is the example of what I have done. It was a video that I made during the night. There was a thief who stole things from my car. It was within a minute. So if my camera had a smart device which could recognize what was happening, then I would receive a signal immediately. But Back then, because it is a typical microcontroller with a processor which uses other things, well, if it's software, it can recognize within a minute, but with accelerator, it can be done 100 times faster. It can work in real time. Can we accelerate microcontrollers with special manuals, with special vectors that are used uh, with CMD? It is used at Skolkova for startups. Unfortunately, these vector solutions, they have restrictions, limits in terms of efficiency. And at the same time, we cannot put GPU into these microcontrollers because it is too big for it. It uses too much power. So if we want to install lots of 
different chips into this microcontroller. It will work slow because it is too much for it. It will have problems with computational density as per this um, area. So ARM, they launched a new solution. This is a neural processing unit, NPU, for microcontrollers. It's called ARM SS U55. It is an example that I will use. Usually you install microcontrollers STM32 or something from MNXP or from other ARM processes. But we can see that they are based on other things. They are used in uh, with cutters Cortis Sam but I can say that they actually use neural processing unit not lots of people know about this and within five minutes I'll try to explain how it works and then I will tell you how you can design a competitor to this NPU what this neural processing unit allows us to carry out the tasks of machine learning on microcontroller and it is 50 times faster. So how you turn it into a startup? First of all, when it's a startup, you can decide what you want to create. You can sell different devices to end users. For example, in Genic Times, they published an article that these microcontrollers can be installed into smart home devices, smart speakers. It is at your home, and you can ask these uh, smart speakers to turn on some music that you want. So these are the devices. But without NPU, this microcontroller, it is too slow. But you can use special chips for these devices, but you can make it on your own. For example, you can get a license. It can be ARM Cortex M55, and then you can license this component ARM Masses U55, and you can make a chip which can be used for something special, for a special application that you understand. When I was in Kazakhstan, it was quite interesting. It was a project that wanted to make the first chip on their own for uh, these people who work uh, there with uranium. Usually, workers who are there, they have special devices. They are in the mines wearing different PPE. It has sensors, and then this information is collected. So you have all the information about them. So you can use machine learning for such devices. So with sensors, it can be faster. It is a fast analysis of the air, and if something happens in this mines with air, there is a signal. So these people who created such devices, they realized that they have unique knowledge how to create something important. Sensors with a chip which can be ideal for this device and it can be low power. It's not about chip and uh, their licenses. You can also have a startup which 
makes neural processing unit on their own. But why to make it, why to have such startups if this NPU are made by ARM? But, well, for this, there are lots of opportunities to do this. ARM neuroprocessing unit, which are used by Tiny ML, it has specific limits. It is supported just with CNN and only RNN neural network and only quant the data can be 8 byte, but there are lots of other options, different types of neural nets, and special NPUs can make these new networks, these types, which cannot be processed by NPU from ARM. And in Russia, as we can see, based on the previous presentation, there are startups who create their own components, they do their core, and they can make their own NPU. So Russian startups who create such components which can be integrated into the chips they are created and they can be used especially for tiny ML. So what this component does, I will try to explain in three minutes. It can be a special device to use it as a big data. This is a compiler. This is the way this code looks like. It is tender flow light micro application code. It works on the microcontroller. This is the model. This is the number of comments for this neuron processing unit. And then you have processes which are filled with special sets. You have different weights, you have information about scale, then NPU says that you can go ahead with the special information, then this NPU starts to work independently, it processes manuals independently, it takes data from the general memory, it stocks, it uses lots of devices and then the results are given back and then it stops if the processor takes this information and recognizes that the computing is completed. What is inside of this device? For the past 30 years, Designers of microchips use the description uh, of devices as CPU and DHL. If there is a microcontroller and an embedded chip, the processor itself was designed 40 years with, this, with the help of a uh, just a m mouse on the screen designing schemes. But today we use a special language. Uh, in this language we produce schemes and turn them into transistors. This, these transistors are manufactured. So it, it's turned into the machine code. And there, is, there are certain types of engineers called RTL design engineers, 
With the help of the code mentioned above, they describe a certain scheme design. So this code is turned into a specific design. It can be a processor, it can be a neuro accelerator. On the right hand side, you can see uh, the the vision, the image of the code. In Verilog software, the uh, physical design engineer that converts logic into physics. It creates a floor plan based on the inputs above the connectivity from the chip architect and block. So it's all turned into microchips. The companies based in the Silicon Valley, like NVIDIA, Apple, Intel, Tesla, design the chips uh, also in Russia. Thus, you have the opportunities, the facilities that they offer to program the microchips. Usually these chips are quite costly, but I know that Skolkova has supper to startups program where you can uh, do, where you can design similar chips. Furthermore, you can use Europractice software to create trial chips for a, a minimum um, price. Another program is Game Tray, and lately Google devised a special software with Skywater. It is called eFabless. Where you can design a chip, and if Google will find uh, this chip attractive, they can produce it on their facilities. Thus, today there are limitless opportunities for designing, programming. All the previous speakers mentioned that there is a huge and enormous market for tiny ML. And I want to add that this market is not only huge, but it's very fragmented, which means that there are a lot of applications available on the market that can be run, can be used by startups, and that, cannot, that all cannot be covered by a standard microchip like uh, MS32, because there are different niches, there are different requirements in terms of neural networks, there are niches for special applications, in particular for smart ag agriculture, like uh, installing small sensors all over a field and reap the harvest. So the opportunities are limitless. Thank you so much. Any questions? I will welcome any questions from your side. If you do not have any questions, you are welcome to see uh, to watch educational programs we have launched. They are available on the chat. Why don't you continue, uh, Yuri? And I think we need to finish like in, in one minute and then uh, yeah. we'll have some concluding uh -huh. re remarks after this. Yeah. Mm. So to conclude, 
так, где у нас сейчас, сейчас начнут на чат. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, Юрий, uh, Значит, что, что я хочу э, сказать, э, рынок, э, рынок, который открывается с помощью, с помощью TinyML, то есть, э, то есть the market available with TinyML is in fact the extension of the Internet of Things market. Smart agriculture, in smart agriculture in different industries. So this market cannot be covered by standard chips. Thus, I see a large variety of small niches, and I know that there are a lot of young engineers in Russia who, with the help of Russian uh, software and Russian accelerators, have a chance, have the um, facilities to produce uh, different chips. And I know a lot of people uh, studying in uh, various uh, universities, very advanced universities, and they are thinking about how to use different chips in different spheres. Yeah, th thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's a great example how what happens in technology in the past several years and uh, all these tools that are becoming available now. Uh, I think uh, at this point I'm going to summarize the session and the way to summarize the session, yeah, the, the, the way to summarize the, the session, there is one question uh, that was asked, a uh, very interesting question. How do we see this field in 100 years? I ask a question like about five years, 20, 25. So the question is, what is going to happen in 100 years in this field, in tiny ML field? And my answer to this is going to be with uh, the mission statement of the tiny ML foundation and the ecosystem. So in, in 100 years, we are going to see a different world that is going to be much better, much, much healthier, much sustainable world. And this world, world will be enabled by tiny ML technologies that are happening now. We are at the very beginning of, of a big revolution there, and this revolution is going to be, have a big impact in all of areas around us. It's education, healthcare, environment, and the way we do things there. And we do believe that this is going to happen probably sooner than 100 years. And th thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we hope to see you again uh, next year at the village. And thank you all for the for for joining this session, and thank you for the participants. Thank you.
температурах окружающей среды, тела быстро теряют энергию. Но нахождение вблизи источника тепла позволяет телу получать тепловое излучение. Происходит самопроизвольное перераспределение тепла. Следовательно, когда источники тепла находятся вместе, их энергия побеждает холод. Лучшее создается вместе. Газпромбанк. МТС Стартап Хаб. Работа с реальным бизнес-заказчиком МТС. Доступ к ресурсам самого крупного телеком-бренда в России. Не можешь поверить? А в твой стартап обязательно поверят. У нас есть все, что тебе понадобится. Ресурсы, клиенты, технологии, каналы продаж. Мы оценим твой продукт, правильно применим в своем бизнесе и масштабируем на мировой рынок. МТС Стартап Хаб ждет тебя и твоих нереальных бизнес-идей.